All righty, we are going to get started for, we are in the home stretch, last panel of the day. So um, thank you all for sticking it out. Hopefully you've, you've been enjoying this as much as I have. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Randy Lepla, who is uh, the director of the New Environmental Law Clinic, which opens its doors this year uh, here at the law school, which we're really excited about. And so it's great to be able to have Randy here as part of the program as she is uh, putting together uh, the clinic that, that students will begin to uh, participate in uh, starting in the fall semester. So, Randy. Thank you, Professor Hedler. Um, so I'm glad to be here with you, everybody, uh, for the fourth and final panel today. Um, last but not least, of course, and I um, want to go ahead and start by introducing our uh, esteemed panelists here. We have Professor Dave Owen with the UC Hastings School of Law. Um, we have Professor Aaron Ryan, who's with Florida State University, and of course we have Professor and also uh, brother uh, Jonathan Adler down there uh, <laughs> uh, from Ray Jerry Case. So we are really, really excited to hear from all of you today, and with that I will turn it over to you, Professor Owen. All right, um, thank you so much. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, the panels today. I've learned a lot. This has been fascinating. Um, and when I got the invitation to speak at this conference, I thought, okay, I'll talk about WOTUS. That's the biggest thing going. And then I thought, wait, everybody's going to talk about WOTUS. I'm tired of talking about WOTUS. Uh, so we're going on a field trip instead. Um, and so this is a story about a strange and sometimes magical place where some of the problems that we've been talking about today with non-attention to point sources, uh, they still exist, but they're fading. They don't exist to nearly the same extent. Um, so I'll, I'll say a few words about the motivation for the project, why I'm looking at this area. Um, then we'll actually go on the field trip. I'll give you a little bit of the geographic setting. and I'll talk about some of the regulatory initiatives and then a few lessons learned. Um, so this is a story we've already heard a couple of times today, and it's, it's how I think a lot of us would have assessed this, the Clean Water Act looking back at the past 50 years. We'd say we've done a really effective job, maybe almost from economic standpoint, too effective uh, at controlling pollutants from traditional point sources. Uh, we've done a miserable job controlling pollutants from non-point sources. And urban stormwater, which is a wonderful subject, but not what I'm going to talk about right now, is somewhere in between. And the reasons, I think, are also a fairly familiar story. Um, the exclusion of ag sources from the definition of point sources and therefore from the NIPTES program. Um, Non-point source programs that largely leave implementation up to state discretion. Uh, and then, as we saw from Annie Brett's talk earlier, that discretion is often, as far as we can tell, not exercised in, in meaningful ways. Uh, and there, so the question I was going to ask is, how might things be different? And, and we're already, I think, many of us familiar with some places where different approaches have been taken, such so Chesapeake Bay, uh, Lake Champlain. I could have put up Lake Tahoe here, but that would have looked like California snobbery, so I didn't do that. But I still got the line in anyway. Um, but I am going to take us to a trip to the far northwestern corner of California. Um, so California has an interesting Clean Water Act implementation structure. There's also a state statute called the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act. People just call it well, Porter Cologne, and that's how I'll refer to it as well. And then California subdelegates its implementation authority for water quality to regional boards that have permitting authority over different pieces of the state. So in another paper, um, I call use the very catchy term cooperative subfederalism. Um, I didn't really mean that it was catchy, just to be clear. It's not catchy at all. Um, to describe this situation. Um, so we basically have two layers of delegation. And our focus is going to be on the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, which is in the northwestern corner of California. Uh, so here's a map that shows you the area within the board's jurisdiction. It is a huge area. It is also a very sparsely populated area. Um, the only city of, of any significant size is Santa Rosa, which is at the very southern edge of the area. Um, most of it is, uh, is, again, largely unsettled or um, very small population centers and some dispersed population. Uh, it's also a very wet region. Um, this is the wettest part of California. Uh, and in some parts of it, the average precipitation in the year uh, tops 100 or even 120 inches, or at least it used to. Uh, things are changing. Uh, 
Uh, but, but it's also a Mediterranean climate, which means that almost all of this precipitation falls in winter months. In the summer, things are quite dry. Um, and it's also, I didn't have a good slide for this, it's a very steep landscape in most of these areas with relatively young rock that erodes easily. So erosion, sediment are big issues in the region. Um, it is stunningly beautiful. This is really just a tourist plug here. Go see it if you haven't been there. It's a spectacular area. Um, and it's also, for the most part, heavily forested. So the, the map on the left there shows forested areas. The dark green are national forest areas. The light green are state or private forest. Uh, and again, the point here is just that there's a lot of forest uh, with the sole exception of the upper part of the Klamath Klamath River Basin that's within California. That's the, the northeastern portion of the area, which looks more like what you might expect from you know, the plains of Montana with mountains interspersed between. Uh, because it is a forested, wet coastal region, it has and, and historically had many more fish, particularly salmonids. Um, and water quality concerns in this area are very heavily driven by the need of these fish for cold and clear water. So water quality in this area, there's an earlier question about what, what is water quality? How do we define it? In Northwestern California, we define water quality primarily in terms of meeting the needs of migratory fish. It's also an area that's been very heavily impacted by historic human activities. Uh, and this is one example, uh, and this is, so these two shots show the watershed of the Garcia River. Um, and for those of you who teach environmental law or have taken courses, you've probably heard of the Garcia River. There's a very famous case called Pronsolino versus Nastri that appears in a lot of environmental law casebooks. Um, and that case turns out to be a very big part of the story here today, although I won't spend too much time on it. But this is a piece of the Garcia River watershed, and you can see in 1952 on the left, it's basically intact, not really very many water logging roads at all. That was a little bit anomalous because a lot of this watershed started getting trashed along with a lot of the rest of the North Coast by logging practices beginning as early as the 19th century with essentially no environmental controls at all. Um, but here you can see just within a 10 year period, massive amounts of logging taking place with legacy effects that continue to the present day. Um, and this chart gives you a sense of how prevalent these kinds of practices and impacts were throughout the region. It is also an inadvertent plug for taking tax law, a subject that I skipped in law school to my great regret, um, because you can see here that at a point when California changed its tax laws so that landowners were taxed on the value of standing timber, the level of logging skyrocketed. And when California got rid of that law and no longer taxed people on the value of standing timber, levels of, of logging dropped dramatically um, with huge water quality impacts. Um, so a lot of the land is forest, but there is also agriculture throughout the area, um, often in discrete pockets where you have relatively flat valleys, which are not abundant in this region. So there's irrigated agriculture in the northeastern portion of the area, um, ranch lands dispersed around. 95% of the world's calla lilies are grown, grown, grown in one stream valley or one river valley up near the Oregon border. But by far the most important crops are, wait for it, mind-altering substances, yellow yeah, <laughs> on the left, grapes on the right. Okay. So, so here's the, the quick summary of the legal framework. We'll start with the Clean Water Act, um, which we've been talking about all day. And I'll assume some familiarity there. Uh, but we also have in California the Quarter Cologne Water Quality Control Act. And Quarter Cologne is interesting because it regulates discharges. And it doesn't, at least in some provisions, distinguish between point source and non-point source discharges. So it establishes and has established for decades a foundation for regulatory control over non-point source discharges. Uh, and for many years, California implemented these controls with just as much enthusiasm as other states, which is to say not at all. Um, but that has been gradually changing over time. And Order Cologne basically regulates non-point source discharges or establishes a basic framework where you have what are called waste discharge requirements, which are essentially categorical and generalized prohibitions on discharge from certain types of activities. But then the regional boards can create waivers from these categorical prohibitions. And the waivers are generally also conditional. And the waivers can also be categorical. 
or they can be specific to particular sites, particular companies, particular industries. So it is somewhat analogous to what we would think of with general and specific permitting for stormwater or for stream and wetland fills. All right, so here's a quick summary of areas in which the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board has taken this basic framework and has applied it specifically to non-point sources. So there are also point source-based regulatory programs for some of these activities, at least for dairies, but it also has specific non-point source permitting programs um, in all of the different areas that we see here, with the exception of vineyards, uh, where the program is a work in progress. Some of these programs have been around for a while. A lot of them are the last 10 or 15 years, so relatively recent. And I won't summarize all of them, but I'm going to zero in on just a couple of them in more detail. So first, um, and this follows up on Annie Brett's talk a little bit, we're going to talk about Garcia River TMDL implementation. So the Garcia River TMDL is the TMDL that was at issue in Consolino versus Ministry. Um, and for those of you who have read the case, one thing you might remember is that the state of California did not voluntarily approve that TMDL. The North Coast Board wrote it, but the state under Pete Wilson, who was a somewhat conservative governor, wouldn't approve it, and so EPA finally wound up doing so. But after the, well, even before the TMDL was approved, and then definitely afterwards, the state developed, or the North Coast Board developed, a pretty rigorous implementation program for the TMDL. Uh, and that program involves a couple of elements. Again, it involves generalized planning, and then the possibility of site-specific or company-specific exemptions that are conditional and that are designed to be tailored to specific locations. And North Coast Board, of course, North Coast Board staff have been monitoring implementation of this TMDL very carefully, um, and they think they are seeing significant improvements in water quality, uh, particularly in the tributary streams, less so so far in the main stem, but, but in both locations, uh, and that they also think that the massive amounts of sediment have been kept out of the watershed. The other example I will quickly give is with dairies. Uh, and here, again, the basic approach is general uh, prohibitions on discharges that are essentially flat, flat prohibitions implemented through best management practices, the same as happens with, with, with the um, Garcia River TMDL implementation program, and much as with industrial stormwater permits, a uh, dairy owner has to submit a notice of intent, has to monitor, has to report uh, on both practices to implement and conditions near that dairy. Um, so these, are, again, are just two examples. There are a whole bunch of others that I could go through, will go through in the written paper. But I'm just going to skip ahead and talk about some tentative lessons and themes that I'm drawing from the study. I say tentative because part of the research here has been interviewing people who were involved in this program, and I still have a lot of interviews to do. Um, so I'm, I'm still at a somewhat early stage of the research, but it's enough for some tentative conclusions. So number one, non-point source regulation can happen. It exists, and it exists in what is actually a significant part, a pretty conservative part of California, uh, and the world has not exploded. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes, like, it's been so long that we've had this division and we have not really had much effective non-point source regulation that we all get in our heads that it's really, it could never, ever happen. Um, but it could, it does, um, and, and, and again, the world didn't come to an end. Um, second interesting thing is that the Clean Water Act toolbox for non-point source regulation, which I think a lot of us have written negative things about, I certainly have turned out to be a pretty useful foundation. Almost all of the local initiatives here are in some way built on a Clean Water Act requirement, whether it's area planning or TMDLs or some combination of both. Also a lot of use of 401 certifications, also a provision I had never heard about before but has been important um, is Section 1323, which gives the state authority over uh, water quality regulation on national forest lands. And the state uses that authority extensively. Lesson three, this is not rocket science. Um, strikingly, there's not much in the regulatory models that the state, that the, the North Coast Board is using that strikes me as either a very innovative regulatory model or when you look at the specific site-specific techniques. Again, it's things like fences to keep cattle out of streams, buffer zones where people are logging along streams, avoiding logging on very steep slopes, 
Um, some of it is costly. Um, some of it is not very costly at all. Um, but it's not a new and, and highly innovative regulatory model. Uh, and similarly, the basic cooperative federalism structure that's being reproduced at the state level is, is again, it's just reproducing something we already do at the federal level. Um, and, and so the takeaway from these, we don't need a completely new regulatory model to be in invented in order to deal with non-point sources. Um, it's more we just have to do it. Um, counterpoint here is that nobody is describing the work they're doing as easy. Um, and the problems arise in large part because the sources are so geographically dispersed. There's a relatively small staff at this agency spread over a huge area. Um, and relatedly, because so much of the regulation is done through BMPs, it's often difficult to monitor effectiveness. You don't have the same ability to actually monitor outfalls, um, with a very limited exception of, of some irrigation return flows in the northeastern part of the area. Uh, so again, nobody describes this as a simple or easy problem to solve. Lesson five, it's not just the Clean Water Act and it's not just Port of Cologne. There are a lot of other complementary regulatory tools here that matter, including California's stream, uh, scheme for permitting forestry operations on private lands, water rights regulation, um, and then the restoration work and the land acquisition both involve the state and the feds and private entities throwing a lot of money around. And the money matters. It, it helps a lot if you go to a landowner and say, you know, we're going to regulate you, but we'll also happily work with you on a grant application. That combination of things can make regulation a lot more palatable, uh, particularly where it's new. Last lesson is that the existence of a non-point source program can be a matter of degree. So we often think, oh, it's going to be a binary switch where you have no non-point source regulation, and then you might have a fully fledged program. That is not what's happening here. Um, what I was finding, in, what I found instead is that the programs vary in their stringency. They vary in terms of the stringency of the default requirements they have, like do you have to submit a notice or does the state come to you first? Uh, and they also are evolving over permit cycles. So the waivers have five-year cycles and the people at the state agency, or the, the local agency specifically said, well, you know, in this first agency cycle, we just wanted to get a foothold. In the next one, now that we've established some credibility, some relationships, we're probably going to up the stringency a little bit, make the requirements more extensive. And so the larger lesson, and I think this is a lesson that, you know, it's dangerous to try to generalize from California, particularly a very eccentric part of California. But I think the, the generalization we can draw from here is that other regions could ease their way into non-point source regulation and not have to tackle it all at once. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. That's a really valuable project. And um, also, Jonathan, for inviting you to the Cypress celebration of 50 years I don't know if I speak up. Am I not being amplified? Um, is that better? Yeah, you were speaking in the middle of two mics. I have trouble speaking while sitting. That's weird for me, and I feel really short. But I'm trying to make up for that. It took the dance. Anyway, um, I was thanking you, Jonathan, for inviting me to be part of this wonderful celebration of this uh, landmark piece of environmental legislation. And uh, my role in that celebration is to harp upon its flaws. Probably not as much as you will, Jonathan. I'm not sure to say it's obsolete. But I'm going to talk about the limitations in the statute that have left waterways so vulnerable that other that environmental advocates are increasingly turning to other theories of environmental law in order to protect them. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the public trust doctrine and the rights of nature movement as two recent comers to environmental litigation as, as ways of trying to protect these waterways unprotected by the Clean Water Act. I am drawing on some previously published work and my forthcoming book about the public trust doctrine and the Mono Lake story. And the story I want to tell is, is too long for 15 minutes, so I will be drawn in my native New Yorker skills as a speed talker, but I will also make sure to be as clear as I can. And this is my, this is my plan, what I'm, going to try to, what I'm going to try to do with my time today. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you that by its very success, the Clean Water Act has created such high expectations in the public 
that waterways, that U.S. waterways, be drinkable, fishable, and swimmable, that we're therefore really disappointed and, uh, and legitimately frustrated when these goals are undermined by the statutory focus of the Clean Water Act only on matters of water quality and not on protecting water quantity, insufficient quantities that waterways exist and be swimmable and fishable. So the advocates for ailing waterways that are left unprotected have turned to these additional legal tools. The ancient but evolving public trust doctrine, a common law doctrine that assigns certain public rights in navigable waterways and perhaps other resources, and increasingly the ancient but re-emerging rights of nature doctrine that sets forth legal rights in waterways themselves and other features of the natural environment um, in an effort to protect them. I'm going to talk a little bit about how interestingly these seem to be in opposition. They, have, they start from such contrasting environmental ethics where the public trust doctrine, like the Clean Water Act, is unapologetically utilitarian or anthropocentric, focusing on the benefits that waterways and other natural features can confer on people. And the rights of nature movement rejects that wholly for an ecocentric, a biocentric or an ecocentric perspective that considers these waterways and other natural features as valuable in and of themselves without reference to human need. Um, one of these has more attraction in our legal system than the other. But we'll talk about the, um, the, uh, the, the recent emergence of uh, rights of nature movements. Nonetheless, despite these differences, I'm going to talk about how there's this really interesting um, uh, parallelism as these two new approaches to environmental protection of waterways unfold in the way that they're differentiating jurisdictionally. So we see them uh, not as a monolithic movement, but as a mosaic of, in, of sort of independently differentiating features along different legal axes involving the mechanisms, the legal mechanisms by which they operate, the resources that they protect, the values that they protect, and the underlying legal theories that um, give them meaning. So in the end, one thing is clear. Neither of them is trying to supplant the Clean Water Act. They both need the Clean Water Act to continue to do the work that it does. But they both highlight inadequacies um, of the existing means under environmental law to protect waterways. Most uh, we, we blame the Clean Water Act the most because it promises so much. And interestingly, also they partner failures in litigation; they don't always succeed with uh, successes in political advocacy. They seem to be something emotionally, as we, we talked about earlier, there's something emotionally intuitive or appealing about some of these theories. The river belongs to everyone, or the river is valuable in and of itself, um, that motivate uh, communities to act perhaps more effectively in the political sphere than in the legal sphere. So um, I'm going to talk about this almost not at all. You already know about the Clean Water Act. We've been talking about it all day. But I will just remind you that the plan was to restore the nation's waters for swimming, fishing, and drinking, and that this was to be accomplished by the regulation of water quality, the regulation of water quantity under state water law, water allocation law, remains mostly with the states. But as pressure on the water resource grows, the relationship between water quantity and water quality is uh, becoming more intense. So here's the language. The objective of the Clean Water Act is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters by regulating the discharge of pollutants with goals for future of water quality goals. But we've long heard the solution to pollution is dilution, meaning you need to have enough water in the waterway for inevitable pollutants to be, uh, to, to reach those water quality standards. The sediments, for example, are going to be there no matter what. And if we take it one step further, it's not just about pollution. If there's not enough water, if there's not enough quantity in the waterway, we don't, we're not doing much to protect the physical, biological, and chemical integrity of the water. Um, I'm interpreting it here as thought out that it suggested as a waterway. Um, so, we've talked about the tools of the Clean Water Act, discharge standards, performance standards, the, the NIMTES program. Um, none of that is really going to help with quantity in waterways. Only the, maybe Section 404 is the part of the, water, the Clean Water Act that, that specifically speaks to a type of waterway, the wetland. But as we've been talking about all day, we don't really even know what a wetland is, let alone which ones are jurisdictional. I too thought about giving a WOTUS talk. I was like, hey, everybody, we're going to do that. I'm with Dave, I'll do something different. Instead, I shall harp upon its law. Or at least talk about the limitations, the limitations of the statute. And uh, as to review, the plan was to restore the integrity of the nation's waters, but we can't do it if there's no water in the waterway. And right now, population growth in urban areas 
the increasing demands of industry on the water resource through, for example, the energy industry, fracking, cooling, and climate-related drought is just converging on this sort of the, the, the dire uh, the, the direness of the quantity problem. Quality has been the problem, and which we've heard today it's still a problem, but the, the, the increasing pressure on quantity in waterways is really taking um, the headlines. So why don't we have a Clean Water Act approach to regulating water quantity? Well, one problem is that uh, we don't really have a good model. So 50 states all have their own systems of water allocation law. They're really different, not just even east to west, but within these regions, they're really different. Congress and the Supreme Court doesn't even know how to resolve interstate water disputes. They hate to do it. They almost never do. It's a, it's a, it's a big project. So with federal solutions off the table under the Clean Water Act or elsewhere, advocates are shifting to these newer theories, filling this gap left unresolved by the Clean Water Act. So let me introduce you to the first of these, the, the public trust doctrine. This is an ancient common law doctrine with roots as far back as Roman common law, where the Institutes of Justinian framed it this way. By natural law, these things are the common property of all, the air, running water, the sea, and with it, the shores of the sea. And the U.S. received this doctrine through British common law and mostly applied it to navigable waters. The most classic statement of the doctrine comes from a 100-year-old Supreme Court case, more than 100 years old now, Illinois Central Railroad, where the court clarified that under common law, the state holds the title to the lands under navigable waters in trust for the people of the state that they may enjoy the navigation of the waters, carry on commerce over them, and have liberty of fishing therein uh, free from the obstruction or interference of private parties. And much of my own scholarship on the public trust doctrine has traced how this doctrine has evolved from one of a doctrine that's really about sovereign authority over submerged lands to a doctrine requiring sovereign protection of these submerged lands and increasingly environmental protection for environmental values. It also acts as a limit on sovereign power enforceable by the beneficiaries of the trust of citizens in court. And so just to give you a sense of how that works, all the law professors know this case, but for everyone else in the room, I'll give you a 10 cent introduction to a really powerful example, the case from which I just drew that quote, Illinois Central. And I can give you the case in a nutshell. In 1869, the state legislators gave Chicago Harbor to a private railroad. The people were not delighted. The bums were thrown out of office. The new legislature promptly repealed the conveyance. And litigation ensued. And you can probably imagine what that looked like. The railroad said, no, you can't just give us this valuable natural resource and then take it back. There were all sorts of problems with that. And the state said something to the effect of, well, yes, I suppose that would have been a problem if we really had given that to you and then took it back. But that's not a problem because we never gave it to you. This is a navigable waterway protected by the public trust doctrine, so we didn't have the authority to give it to you. Those bonds that we threw out, they may have acted like they were giving you something, but it didn't really happen. And the Supreme Court accepted that theory. And so that premise of state sovereign ownership and responsibility for navigable waterways is kind of the bedrock of the public trust doctrine across the 50 states. But from there, we see this remarkable differentiation of the public trust doctrine in all these different directions. Uh, and I'll very briefly touch on the different forms of law that operate to make the doctrine work, the different resources protected by the doctrine, the different values protected, and I won't have enough time to talk about this because I think it's so interesting, but the different legal theories about the nature of the doctrine. So first, really quickly, different forms of law. We've seen the common law version that was one that was an operation in Illinois Central. Um, many states have constitutionalized the doctrine and in doing so, changed it, expanded it. For example, here's Pennsylvania's Environmental Rights Amendment. Um, which says the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. So that's a little bit broader than the Illinois Central version of the doctrine. We also see versions in statutory law, and I've given some examples from Minnesota and California. The different states protect different resources under the doctrine. They all start with the same doctrine of state ownership of submerged lands, but some states, like California, has recently extended it to groundwater resources. In Michigan, by administrative, by the executive order, the Great Lakes water quality is protected. Other states have protected other resources, also susceptible to appropriation or monopoly, like the, the Pennsylvania uh, Constitution that we just looked at, protects all public natural resources. 
Virginia's constitution adds cultural resources. California, and at least one case, suggests it applies to biodiversity. And the most famous extension of the doctrine is probably what we see in the Juliana case, the, uh, the atmospheric trust project that has attempted to uh, allege violations of the doctrine for failure to regulate greenhouse gases of the air commons that Justinian included in the doctrine. The Juliana case has had uh, mixed success in court. But in uh, the political sphere, it has had some more success in terms of galvanizing and motivating um, interest groups. And I'm giving you the example of Massachusetts, where the same strategy resulted in the governor's executive order of an integrated climate change strategy. So perhaps more success politically. Different values are protected. Always start with traditional navigational values, transportation, commerce, fishing. Also, recreational and aesthetic values, like swimming and kayaking and walking around the Great Lakes, recreational access, beauty. Also, cultural and historic values, I mentioned the Virginia Constitu Constitu uh, Constitution, and increasingly environmental values. So Virginia, in addition to cultural values, protects the atmosphere. California, most famously, in the case that I love best, affirmed that the doctrine extends to ecological habitat and scientific values at Mona Lake. And I am legally obligated to always talk about Mona Lake when I talk about the public trust doctrine, because it is where I got my start in the field and led me to this moment here. But this is the case from 1983 where the California Supreme Court had to balance demands on the water resource by uh, 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 the city of Los Angeles and the, um, uh, the, the ecosystem in the eastern watershed of Yosemite National Park and ultimately concluded that the ecosystem had to be protected but that there were still legitimate values that must be served uh, down south. And this highlights the core challenge for the use of this doctrine in environmental um, uh, protection, which is anthropocentrism. The doctrine protects values for the benefit of the people. But if the people want to pave paradise and put it on a parking lot, there's really not a lot to be said about that, which is where the rights of nature movement will pick up. Before I, before I go to that, I will just acknowledge one of the more interesting places of development of the doctrine of the different legal theories of the trust across the states. Is it an ordinary common law doctrine susceptible to legislative abrogation as the state of Idaho thinks it is? Or is it a quasi-constitutional doctrine that the legislature can't touch, like California thinks it is? And there's a lot of movement about the public trust doctrine as a background principle of state law that can defend environmental regulation of waterways against taking challenges. And we see some splits among the states there. But in my last few minutes, I want to turn to the biocentric alternative, the rights of nature movement, which rejects the anthropocentrism of the public trust doctrine and instead tries to think about environmental rights as inherent in nature itself. So instead of human rights to enjoy natural systems, this approach would protect the rights of ecosystems and their components to exist. And most often, those ecosystems are waterways, or they're around water. Um, the historical origins of the doctrines certainly have roots in indigenous cultures worldwide for countless generations. Here in the Western legal tradition that we're talking from, it probably starts with the Supreme Court's rejection of it in Sierra Club v. Morton in 1972, but that led to a raft of scholarship reviving whether it should play a role. And um, before we go further, I want to acknowledge the core challenge for this, the use of this doctrine in environmental protection is pragmatic. Who speaks for nature when nature can't talk? And what if the people who are talking don't always agree, which it turns out happens a lot. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, this is the Constitution of Ecuador, amended in 2008 to include a rights of nature provision. Pretty straightforward. Nature has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structure, functions, and evolutionary processes. All persons, communities, peoples, nations can call upon public authorities to protect it. And then it goes on to talk about what those needs, what those rights look like, the right to be restored, the right to evolve. I don't have time to tell you about how much has happened worldwide with regard to the rights of nature, but there's actually been a lot. We see movement in uh, Ecuador, New Zealand, Australia, India, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Colombia, and domestically as well. There's been a raft of, mostly at the municipal level, um, uh, mostly ordinances passed in California, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida. In 2020 alone, there were 15 local rights of nature ordinances, all designed to protect waterways under threat, mostly of water bottling plant withdrawals. Um, and so, there's a lot going on. The state attempts to preempt them with the bill saying we're not going to acknowledge any of those local ordinances. And yet they still, after that preemption, there was a ballot initiative bringing them into force. So we see this, this sort of political sphere, um, uh, legal sphere, uh, disjunction. 
Uh, perhaps the most important movements are happening at, at the level of North American tribes and First Nations. Uh, I've given a slide of some important tribal moves forward. But where I want to, I, I want to do two last things before I give up the floor. Obviously, I don't have time to talk about this in any detail, but I want to show the same axes of differentiation in the rights of nature context that I've mentioned in the public trust context. So across the world and across the states, we see different approaches to the answer to the question of what gets protection under the rights of nature. Is it all nature, like the Ecuador Constitution says? Is it specific ecosystems, like in Oceania, it's very much rivers? Is it uh, supporting specific species, like a species of wild rice in Minnesota? Who speaks for rights holders that don't talk? Anyone, like in Ecuador? The specific local community with a relationship to the resource, which is the primary approach in the United States municipalities. Is it guardians appointed to the resource? What legal mechanisms vindicate it? The Constitution, legislative statute, local ordinances, judicial action, we see all of these. Finally, what rights are actually being protected? Many of these are framed as legal personhood. So uh, rights, uh, New Zealand has given a national park legal personhood the same rights as a person. But other approaches say there are all these rights that people can't actually have that we think nature has, should have, the right to evolve. It's not really something a person has. And in some places, it looks more like a form of strong environmental protection. Australia requires a strategic plan to protect the Yarra River. So I'm going to conclude on this, on this slide here. These things are differentiating in front of us as we speak. They're, what's really remarkable is that the predominant focus of both contexts are waterways that are beyond the protection of the Clean Water Act um, and I think that reflects the centrality of water and waterways to nature and ecosystems and how important it is that we're not solving that. It reflects the shortcomings of conventional environmental legal protection, especially in the Clean Water Act, to do this job. As I mentioned, they both pack intuitive and emotional appeal to people that leverages, perhaps maximizes their effect in the political arena, uh, even when they fail to produce resources by results in court. And they both represent an argument of last resort. Everybody starts with the Clean Water Act. They only come here when the Clean Water Act is not getting the job done. Um, and they voice, I think, the concerns underserved by conventional environmental law and systems vulnerable or unrepresented in traditional cost-benefit analysis for some of the reasons we talked about earlier. Now, if I had more time, I would remark on perhaps the false dichotomy of the anthropocentrism, ecocentrism divide, because we see the same people who both beliefs, the same movements using both beliefs, but I am past my time, so I will just end there and look forward to our Q&A. Thank you. Sorry, no slides, no pretty pictures, but hopefully you still can remember all of Dave's pretty pictures, and they will carry you through on my remarks. I also was, was going to talk about Otis, but then I would have been arguing with, with, with Bill um, not talking about, about Boris either. Um, but I, I did want to talk about this question, which I've been thinking about in the context of environmental statutes more generally, and which I think is a question that our legal system is dealing with, and the court system is dealing with, which is a problem that some people would characterize as statutory obsolescence. And what is it, and what do we do about it? Um, Aaron, at the close of her, near the close of her remarks, said, you know, Folks are concerned that the Clean Water Act, whatever it was doing, isn't getting the job done. That the, the things that relate to water quality that we are most concerned about today aren't being addressed adequately. And one question I want to pose, and, and I'm trying to pose the question more than, than answer it. Um, I, mean, I, I, have my own, I have an answer, I think, but I really think it's more useful to try and pose the question is if we, if we view the Clean Water Act as something that certainly did some very significant things, certainly helped improve water quality in this country over the last 50 years, particularly with regard to controlling point sources and funding um, uh, treatment plants and the like, um, but isn't continuing to produce the, the type of progress that we, that we want, that we demand, that we uh, believe we should be able to have, is, is that a is that a consequence of something we might characterize as statutory obsolescence? And if so, um, what then will we do about it? And uh, we might think that the problem is statutory obsolescence for the simple reason that this is a law that was enacted 50 years ago. It hasn't meaningfully been, uh, other than funding infrastructure projects and, and water projects, the, the, the regulatory aspects of the law 
have not been meaningfully altered in 35 years. Um, the last time that was seriously proposed um, was in 1994, and um, at progress or efforts to amend the bill were pulled from pulled from the floor or pulled from consideration um, because of fear of what the final bill would look like, and a desire not to let something pass that would not uh, uh, continue the legacy of, of of the Clean Water Act, or at least what. Um, uh, the supporters of, of reauthorization wanted. So we have a bill that's not been reauthorized, its regulatory provisions have not been reauthorized in 35 years, have not been meaningfully changed, and, and I think it's worth at least asking the question, well, is it in some ways obsolete? Um, and, um, and so what I want to say a little bit about is, is uh, how we might think about statutory obsolescence, just kind of generally like what causes it, how would we identify it, because I do think it matters whether we think the problem is obsolescence as opposed to, say, poor drafting or something most based on mistaken premises or something that has problems for uh, lack of enforcement, lack of funding. Right? There, are, there are plenty of statutes out there that don't do all the things we want them to do, and the problem is something else. Right? Congress has a grand vision of what agencies are going to do and then never writes the checks to let agencies do it. That's a, another common problem we see in, in a lot of areas. Um, and, I, and again, I, one of the reasons I'm interested in this is I do think we are at a particular moment where um, certainly at the Supreme Court, um, the view of statutory obsolescence, uh, uh, there, there is a particular view of statutory obsolescence and, and the view that I think we get from the Supreme Court and I think has been uh, very clearly signaled this term um, and will probably uh, emphasize in, in June is um, in, if a statute is obsolete, Congress has to do something about it, that agencies don't get to pour new wine out of old bottles. Uh, and if there are problems today that need to be addressed, agencies don't get to play the, the game of trying to repurpose statutory language and find uh, uh, dormant sources of authority to address those new problems. They instead have to go to Congress and say, please give us the authority to do it, right? That's the CDC eviction moratorium decision. That's the OSHA ETS decision. I suspect that will be the West Virginia versus EPA decision. Um, and so that might be a way, to, uh, 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 something that, that should inform how we think about the Clean Water Act if we think the problem is, is obsolescence. So, um, and again, I, you know, we might think it's obsolescence, we might think it's lack of follow through by Congress, we might think it's something else. Um, but I do think there is a general view that, that whatever we think the Clean Water Act accomplished we're not satisfied with the current trajectory of what of what it is accomplishing now and what we think it's going to be accomplishing um, without some change. Um, so what can make a, a statute obsolete? Well, the most obvious is the world changes, right? I mean, um, uh, technology in particular. Um, and if you're thinking about what makes a statute obsolete, one of my favorite examples is look at, at the telecoms, telecom statutes, right? Telecommunications Act, relatively young compared to the Clean Water Act. It was significantly reformed in 1996. But like, think about all the companies in the tech space and in the telecommunications space that didn't exist in 1996. You know, we're talking today about questions like you know, net neutrality and whether or not uh, what the rules should be about the relationships between internet service providers and content providers and so on. The authors of the, of the 1996 reforms didn't even know those were questions. Right? The statute, the authorities that were given, the things that the, the Congress was thinking about at the time are completely different from the things we're concerned about now. And certainly, we know that that's a problem in many areas of environmental law. Right? Climate change being a big example that we have lots of statutes that have not been uh, meaningfully reformed in the 21st century that were focused on more traditional forms of air pollution, more traditional sorts of environmental concerns. The language might be repurposable, right? might be uh, capacious enough to address something like climate change, but we know that's not the, the, the focus it had when it was written, and it creates challenges. right? So the language is capacious enough in the Clean Air Act to encompass greenhouse gases in Massachusetts versus EPA, but then when you get to the UR case, you go, well, we can't quite do all of it that way, so we let EPA do some of it, not others, and again, you know, I suspect in West Virginia um, uh, we will see a more restrictive view. Um, a statute might also be obsolete because it's a victim of its own success, right? Statute, there are a lot of water pollution problems. We are going to focus first and foremost on um, uh, ensuring we get treatment. 
uh, and funding treatment plans so, so local communities uh, uh, get some help in that regard and really focus on point sources. And we've squeezed, core, you know, we've, we've squeezed a, a, about as much out of that sponge as we can, not completely, but we've, we've gotten the bulk of that. And, and so the Act's done that, but we have other water quality concerns. And so um, uh, that, as we talked about, um, the statute wasn't as focused on, and as Robin noted earlier, you know, it wasn't people weren't aware of non-point sources, right? This wasn't a question of, of the statute drafters, you know, or us today as being aware of problems that didn't exist at the time, but that's not where we decided to focus our efforts. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, political, the political challenges of saying the federal government's gonna start regulating farmers, for example, um, being one of them. Um, there's a lot of change in understanding, a lot of knowledge that, that uh, is different. Um, we know a lot more about water pollution. We know not a lot more about what affects ecological systems and hydrological systems. We know uh, a lot more about what sorts of, what the consequences are of different sorts of uh, regulatory policy strategies. Uh, and um, had you know, that knowledge suggests that some of the things that the Clean Water Act did were a smart idea, and some of it says, oh, we could do it better if it was rewritten, right? That's, that's another reason why a statute might become obsolete. It doesn't encompass itself um, a, a, a contemporary understanding of, how, of, of the nature of the problem and, and how we might do it. Um, our technical capa ca uh, capacities vary, right? A lot of early environmental law, and I'm oversimplifying, but you're at times by, well, what can we actually do right, in the water context? A point source is, source is easy to identify, relatively. And it's, you know where it is, you can measure what's coming out of it, you can see if the person's complying, you can require a permit, you can check the permit, right? As we all know, you know yes, there are ways perhaps to try and avoid that or try to, to, to engage in subterfuge. In um, the Maui case, there was lots of discussion of you know, how the, how we define point source could affect um, a folks trying to, to evade that. But today we know, we know a lot more about how you could monitor. Uh, we have the ability to monitor and trace in ways that were kind of science fiction in, in not, certainly in 1972 and to some degree in 1987. I don't think we've fully taken advantage of that, but there are, there are things we could think about doing in terms of monitoring and enforcement that would have been fanciful uh, 35 years ago. And so that might be a, a, sort of, a source of change capabilities. A change politics. Uh, the political consensus that led to the enactment of various environmental laws. Is that the political consensus we have today? Right? I mean, um, in the 20th century, it was common for environmental laws to pass you know, with overwhelming majorities. Um, not all of them, but, but pretty common for that to happen. I don't, you know, unless it's giving lots of money to state and local governments. Uh, on a bipartisan basis, I don't think you can get the, you know, that, that you can still get big bipartisan votes, right? We had that conservation bill a few years ago. We've, had, we've seen with infrastructure and water resources. But when it comes to the regulatory stuff, um, uh, the politics have changed. And, um, and so, you know, that, that can be, uh, we might think of that as a type of obsolescence, a statute not reflecting public consensus. Uh, and then change legal environment, as I've already mentioned. Um, uh, the jurisprudence of the current court is not the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of the 1970s, of the 1980s, probably not of the 1990s, probably, it's probably different than any of us remember. I say probably because, you know, we, I say probably because I was thinking about what I was gonna, what I was gonna say today before Wednesday's order. Um, <laughs> so I might have had to adjust it, but, but you know, it, it, that, 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 that matters, right? Because, um, um, and um, it's something that, that uh, we should think about. And, and the fact that there are additional factors which really weren't at all on the minds of at least those focused on the Clean Water Act, like climate change, which matters for water, um, uh, uh, contaminants like P uh, PFAS and uh, microplastics and the like. I mean, there are lots of things that, that were, we were not uh, thinking about and, and, and focused on um, that, could, that we might need us to think that uh, the act uh, is, um, uh, is obsolete. Um, and there are some things, you know, there's some things that are kind of obvious, um, as I mentioned, you know, contaminants that we hadn't thought of. Um, we have knowledge about, about the nature of cumulative and, and synergis synergistic, synergistic effects among pollutants that we didn't have 35 years ago. 
Um, you know, our, our old fashioned dose response curves don't really capture what we care about in a lot of consequences. We've been talking a bunch today about, about environmental justice and about how some communities bear a disproportionate burden. And part of the concern that we are aware of today, but have not always been aware of, is that part of that concern is because of the, the cumulative nature of the burdens. Um, so a lot of things that the, the act doesn't uh, address. Now, for much of the last 20, 30 years, because as you know, sexual obsolescence isn't unique to the environmental context. It's something that we see in other, in other areas. The response to statutory obsolescence has been administrative creativity. Um, some of this goes by the, the, under the label of presidential administration, largely owing to uh, a, a famous article by um, uh, Justice Kagan when she was an academic about um, uh, the executive branch uh, taking more kind of control and ownership over uh, uh, administrative policy and directing agencies to act in ways that are consistent with the current administration's policy agenda and vision. And part of that is in some respects um, hurting agencies along and helping them perhaps uh, uh, adapt or, 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 uh, or respond to changing circumstances. And you know, that was something that um, the Clinton administration did in the environmental context when Congress wouldn't, uh, uh, for example, enact changes to laws governing various natural resources and federal lands. Uh, the Department of the Interior was, uh, you know, Bruce Babbitt and John Lushy were very creative in trying to figure out how to do administratively what Congress wouldn't authorize. The Bush administration, when Congress would not uh, enact its uh, uh, proposed reforms to the Clean Air Act, largely because Congress wanted to include carbon dioxide, and the Bush administration decided it didn't want to include carbon dioxide. It tried to do that administratively uh, by simply rewriting the regulations. And, and unlike with the Clinton administration's efforts, most of those uh, efforts were, were thrown out in court. Um, the Obama administration, in, 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 under some uh, laws, something similar, right? Uh, much of cl climate policy is at the EPA was a response, at least in part, to the fact that Congress did not show an interest in climate legislation. Um, but um, one thing that's certainly, I think, different now is those avenues of dealing with the problem of obsolescence, letting the updating occur within the administrative process, doesn't really look available. Um, we seem to have a Supreme Court, at least, that isn't interested in that, um, that once um, uh, uh, the, the agencies to go back to Congress. Uh, there may also be an interest in other sorts of constraints on agency action, which um, in the context of the Clean Water Act might also be a particular problem. That is, that we talked earlier today about US versus AEP. I'm not sure the current court thinks, thinks that view of the Commerce Clause is um, uh, the right view of the Commerce Clause. I'm not convinced they would adopt that as, as expansive a view uh, as, as my brother Adler uh, uh, expounded earlier. Um, not sure about that, but I think there are hints of that. Um, uh, if we're talking about 404. I strongly suspect the court's view of when Section 404 might create takings um, is quite different than what lower courts have assumed for the past 30, 40 years. Um, uh, and we're all, there's also something else which I want to throw out, which I think fits into my theme, but I, I think it's particularly important just to note that that is something that's changed in the legal environment that I don't think was thought about in the Clean Water Act, which is the way um, policy-driven litigation combined with jurisdiction sh shopping creates a particular challenge for trying to administer any sort of complex regulatory statute. And I think that's a particular problem for the Clean Water Act because unlike, say, the Clean Air Act, the, the allocation of which courts get to hear which sorts of cases makes no sense um, and um, makes certain types of reforms particularly vulnerable to attorneys general with the other party that want to um, make an administration's life miserable. Um, so these are some things, you know, this might lead us to, and I know I'm at my time, so let me, let me, um, let, let me say, if we think the Clean Water Act is obsolete, what do we do about it? Um, and I'll, you know, well, the administrative avenue might not be there. The easy answer is, well, Congress can just fix it, but, you know, um, we, none of us, we're, not very, we're not very optimistic about that. I mean, we can maybe hypothesize strategies. So I'm going to throw out a, 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 an idea that, that, that uh, I played with in a paper I, I co-authored with, with Chris Walker that, that was looking at the question of, you know, how does, con among other things, how does Congress make itself deal with statutory obsolescence by, by legislating on a more regular basis? Um, and, and I throw this out because it's, it's something that, again, we've been toying with and, 
And I'd love to see what would happen if, if someone takes this up. So as I mentioned, the Clean Water Act has not been reauthorized since 1987. And in principle, um, agencies aren't allowed to spend money because Congress isn't allowed to appropriate money for unauthorized programs. Now, Congress can get around that because if no one raises a point of order, the appropriations bill passes and the checks get written and no one cares. Um, but as I understand the way Congress's rule works, all it takes is a point of order. Um, and you could tie up the money that enables the EPA to issue permits under the Clean Water Act. The prohibition doesn't need to be reauthorized, right? If Congress enacts something prohibit prohibiting something, you can't discharge a pollutant without a permit, that's the law until Congress changes it. But the agency action which requires the expenditure of money from Congress needs to be appropriated, and again, that money is supposed to be appropriated pursuant to a program that's been authorized. The reason we kind of threw this out is because we, we speculated that if the prohibitions remained, but the permits that allow folks to operate it within those prohibitions were uncertain, that might be the sort of thing that might make Congress realize that it has to get back to the old fashioned idea of legislating, which means you all get to sit down and you realize no one's gonna get everything what they want and you're gonna have to have a compromise and you're gonna have to do something that updates the statute in a way that is uh, livable at least for those who want the statute to, do, to, to uh, uh, continue to improve water quality but also to uh, uh, be not, not overly burdensome to the regulated community. Um, could that work? I don't know. Um, if any of you have better ideas about how to deal with statutory uh, obsolescence, I'd love to hear them. Um, but I do think in the context of the Clean Water Act, like other statutes, that is something uh, that we need to think about. And I apologize for going over, and I'll stop there. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. And um, we will definitely take questions now, but I wanted to also give the three of you the opportunity because um, there's been some very fresh and interesting ideas, including you know forced compromise, which is a very novel concept these days. Um, but if either of you want to uh, comment uh, on, uh, on anyone else's presentation, I want to make sure you guys have the opportunity to do that before we turn to questions. So Jonathan is the essence of your argument that the Clean Water Act is obsolete because the No, I, I think the statute might be obsolete. I think the, if it is obsolete, the consequences of its obsolescence are greater because the ways we have dealt with obsolescence are less available. That is to say, in the, you know, if the problem of obsolescence is a lack of updating, a lack of keeping something contemporary and up to date. But that's my question, is it, is it out of date because the, the viewpoint Is that okay. elite because the problem that it sought to solve is solved or can't be solved by the government? Maybe all of the above. I mean, right, because point sources largely, largely solve, um, uh, certainly, uh, but not, right? Um, non point sources, not solved. Can it be solved? Well, if every state, if the rest of all the country becomes like that part of California, solved, otherwise, not solved. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, closer to being solved, and you know, is is Congress different? Well, sure, yes. Um, you know, is 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 in statutory obsolescence? I would argue is is always first and foremost a consequence of, of Congress not doing its job, um, and we may say it's not doing its job because they don't want to do their job. They don't. I mean, I, we can we can we can ma we can attribute that to whatever we want, but I, but certainly, uh, you know, my view is that that's always the first order reason that that you know the reason why environmental statutes were subject to reauthorization in part was because hey, we're going to have to revisit this because and they just stopped. I think that's a really valid valid point. I, I think it's really important that you raise this point. And and the only thing I would add is if we apply that test to the Clean Water Act, how many other bedrock? legal acts would we also undo by that same logic? There might be a lot. I, I think so. Yeah. And so it sort of raises the question, and I think it's a legitimate <laughs> theoretical question about, you know, some states like mine, Florida, require us to do a constitutional revision every so often. Some, you know, Jefferson thought that was the way to go federally. But I just, I, I don't have an answer to this question as much as to raise it. I think your point really raises important questions about, is there some reason for 
slowing down the, 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 the winds. I don't know. You know. Is there some reason to be to have a bicameral system to sort of slow down uh, fast changes? I, I don't know the answer. I think it's a really important question that you've raised. I just would question how far that should go. Well, I know we have several questions, so we'll start over here. So um, earlier uh, talks talked about the, the various parts of the statute and language that uh, can be read different ways, use of different words and everything. What about um, using other uh, statutes to inform or, um, or direct what should be done? For instance, Section 102.1 of the National Environmental Policy Act, which says that uh, it directs the, all the agencies of the federal government to um, interpret public laws and regulations uh, to effectuate the goals set out in NEPA, which include protection for generations to come, public trust, uh, all, of, all of that. So, you know, certainly it seems to be where the Biden administration has stated um, the, its general policy. Um, but, uh, you know, thoughts on whether the courts are going to uh, look favorably on that at all. <laughs> I'm not leading with that in any of my briefs. <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, I think as we all know, like broad sweeping language, even within the statute that is being interpreted, doesn't carry a whole lot of weight with the courts generally, and particularly, I think, with the Supreme Court when it's sort of sweeping public interest oriented language. So I think just as a matter of tactics, importing language from another statute that I don't think the courts particularly like and using it to sort of add some muscle to the Clean Water Act is, it, it doesn't seem promising. I, I might actually disagree with that a little. Um, so if we assume Chevron's not going to be overturned, and I actually don't think it will be, I think, it'll, I think the Supreme Court will continue to ignore it, um, other than the occasional concurrence or dissent that complains about it, and, um, but it will be left around for, for lower courts to, to use. And there's a lot of empirical work now about, about the effect that it has. And so in that context, you know, for example, an executive order reminding all of every, every federal agency, this is how they should be interpreting their authority, I, this is how they should be using their, what I wouldn't call interpretive authority, but it's really policy discretion, right? What is, the definition of a source was not a question of semantic meaning, it was a question of policy choice. Um, that can have an effect. Um, and outside of at least of one federal district court in Louisiana, that sort of executive order shouldn't cause a legal problem. Um, um, I'm referring to the social cost of carbon decision for folks that missed the reference. Um, uh, where a court declared an executive order unlawful even without pretending it wasn't, that's what it wasn't what it was doing and made a mess of like two thirds of the administrative law syllabus. Um, <laughs> But you know, if, if you're doing that and you're and you're and you're focusing on policy discretion, I think there's a lot of room. I think the problem is is where you, where what it looks like the agency is doing is more. That's when you're that's when you're waving the red flag in front of in front of the courts, right? Um, and you know, the problem in a lot of contexts is the this what I the phrase I keep using is is new wine out of old bottles. And and you know, if you go back and listen. Um, to the oral arguments in the two COVID cases, and then you look at the, you know, those decisions are sparse. They're, they're, there's not a lot there to, to get out of them, um, but it's pretty clear that's a motivating thing, and, and that's what you have, you know, that what you have to worry about. But, but saying, hey, interpret your authority to advance this, this goal that Congress endorsed, that would seem to be relatively safe on, in terms of some of the things we're talking about. I have, I have two questions. The first is for both Professor Aaron Ryan and Professor Jonathan Adler. The first is whether one of the 
sources of ossification in the Clean Water Act is our system of cooperative federalism. When that is combined with public choice dilemmas, doesn't that drive the lack of success of Clean Water Act? And I'm speaking from someone who lives in Alabama, where you have one political party that's functioning, state judges who are elected, no fourth state to speak of, and then an agency that broadly favors industry. My second question is, given the extent to which Congress holds the federal government and the economy hostage with the debt limit and failure to pass a budget, is the use of appropriations really the best response, given our experience in that arena, um, in getting Congress to update the statute? And that's for Jonathan. Um. I do think cooperative federalism can be a problem, um, probably for somewhat different reasons. And I have a, a what's probably a minority view that I think part of the big problem there is that it, it for, for all but the experts, it diffuses accountability because it's not clear to everyone who's responsible for what. And blurring of those boundaries um, increases the costs of monitoring and enforcement and, 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 and holding policymakers accountable. Um, and in areas where you see less of a federal presence, um, there is evidence, it's not overwhelming, but there is certainly suggestive evidence that in areas where the federal government is less involved, you do see greater levels of state innovation and you see greater levels of states copying successes. Um, why that is, is uh, I mean, there's, there's been a very, various papers trying to give an, expl an, an explanatory account about why that is and I know the ones that I find personally convincing, but I don't think empirically we can say this account is, is the reason more than the other. Um, but I also suspect that in our current political environment, um, one factor is that if the federal government's involved, things are polarized in a way. You know, it's not solving a local problem in your local community. It's now something that where a red team versus blue team gets involved. But um, so I definitely think the way we allocate responsibility between state governments and the federal government in environmental policy is not always helpful. On the other one, um, I would just simply say that um, if Congress feels or wants to spend money or feels it needs to spend money, um, that does seem to motivate, these days motivate them more than other things. Um, and the other thing that motivates them is um, some clear need that is felt by constituents that don't have a clear partisan valence. So, you know, you look at things like how quickly Congress moved when there was a big concern about um, the VA, right? Um, Congress is capable of doing it. And, and my point is simply that um, while we may not like kind of debt limit dynamics, Action is better than inaction, and, and if replicating that sort of dynamics but forces congressional action, well, then maybe we need that. And there are contexts where we do that in a less high-stakes way. Uh, the Base Closing Commission, the way we do um, uh, 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 fast-track for trade negotiations, are, are all, there are a bunch of areas where Congress structures the way it can make choices. So it has to make choices within a certain time frame, but it cuts off what its options are. And those are all done kind of with, the, with an awareness, Congress's awareness of its own limitations and the way politics will get in the way if the decision-making structure isn't um, uh, designed with that in mind ahead of time. Um, you know, I don't think we're in a position um, to be kind of designing the full decision-making structure because that would require proactive legislating. Um, so. Uh, I'm kind of proposing the, the last stitch thing in the sense of, okay, well, you, you, you haven't done that, uh, but there are levers that you might pull that, that could force Congress to do what it was supposed to be doing anyway, and what's the alternative? Right. Last example I'll give, in the paper I did with Chris, um, we talked, for example, about you know, ag programs. You may like them, you may hate them. They get reauthorized, and we know why they get reauthorized, <laughs> because the, the, you know, the, the default, the, the way those, um, the way the statutes are structured is that if they don't get reauthorized, they, they revert to these like depression era defaults that would wreak havoc. Um, it kind of operates like the, um, the hammer provision in RICRA, uh, 
uh, right? Where if certain things don't happen, the default is sufficiently unpalatable that people that otherwise do not share interests will come to the table. And, you know, in, in an area where kind of the ability to, to work across, across partisan lines isn't otherwise available, you probably need something like that. And it's not ideal, but I think it's better than kind of waiting around for them to suddenly reach consensus. I'll just give a very quick rejoinder on the cooperative federalism issue because I know we have other questions. Uh, my very quick rejoinder is just that from the perspective I'll identify is from the perspective of someone who tends to worry more about the underprotection of environmental values and the overprotection. Probably wishing that there was somehow a bigger federal force to overcome what you see as underprotection of environmental values in Alabama. But I will just say that from that perspective of worrying about underprotection environmental underprotection more than overprotection, I have never been more thankful for the cooperative federalism model in environmental law than I was between approximately 2016 and 20. <laughs> so I think that, you know, that, that's, that's a value that both sides of that issue have can feel, which is uh, um, it, it, all the eggs are really in one basket, and then you end up not liking anybody who has any of those eggs. You really... It's a problem. So I think that the corporate federalism model does a flawed but better than uh, alternative um, job at managing the plurality, the pluralism. We have a burning question up top. <laughs> Thanks. It's nice to hear from three very skilled uh, presenters. So quick question for each of you. So for Dave, you were talking about the difficulty and the monitoring and such, but I was wondering with the advances in remote sensing, is that really still, still the case? Um, for Aaron, um, I've been hearing all kinds of stuff about rights of nature. About a decade ago, I heard all kinds of stuff about uh, the public trust. I'm just wondering if there are these sort of moments where something's possible or something's not. And Jonathan, I I'm puzzled by your use of the term obsolescence or obsolete. I mean. Uh, if you took the Clean Water, if the Clean Water Act disappeared tomorrow, there would be changes. I mean, it, it seems to me it's like saying the speed limits are obsolete because they've been around for a long time and they're working. We've got self-driving cars, so there are new issues. So maybe it's inadequate or it's insufficient. But the term obsolescence, the way you're using it, doesn't just it, it doesn't jive with, with my understanding of the idea of obsolescence. Yeah. So uh, if we're going in order. Um, from the conversations I've had, technological evolution makes a difference. Um, and so some aspects of monitoring are either getting easy or potentially getting easier. Um, so to give a very concrete example, um, if, if one of your BMPs is to have cattle fencing areas or in remote areas to have buffer zones along streams, um, you can potentially monitor with drones, and the agency is thinking about getting them. And you can imagine how that's going to go over in an area <laughs> where marijuana growing <laughs> and gun ownership are both through the roof. Um, but, 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 but seriously, you know, technology is evolving, but still what I was hearing was it's partly a monitoring challenge, but it's also a talking challenge. Like if you're, if you're going to regulate in rural communities that traditionally have not been regulated, you need to sit your butt down in a chair and talk to people and couple that with the monitoring, and that's hard to do over large geographic regions. The question to me was about whether the public trust doctrine and the rights of nature moment, uh, movement are just having moments in time and whether they're passing. Flashes in the pan, I think, is the gist of your question. And I think um, I can speak more confidently on the first part. Um, no, I don't think the public trust doctrine was a flash in the pan. But what I think it did was instantiate itself um, maybe in other parts of the, the sort of tripartite system of lawmaking that we have. And so um, in litigation, and you, Dave, you've written about this really persuasively, for example, in the California example, the example of California, where um, it may have been that the public trust doctrine was uh, taken out of the courts and put into the administrative state. Where for example, California, it's a very important part of the administrative procedural decision making environmental matters, and I think that's true not just in California. So I, I definitely don't think it was a flash in the pan, although it may be that people try it out for new things, like, let's try it out for biodiversity, and California had one case that said yes, and then tries to pretend like it never had that case. So there, are, there may be things that look like flash in the pan. With rights of nature, I, I think it's too early to tell, 
But I think it's probably wrong to frame it as a flash in the pan when it has had so much rhetorical power um, uh, internationally and domestically. And the question is whether it's going to function again in litigation, and my guess is probably not. That's a different environmental ethic from the rest of our system of laws, and it fits ill in the Western tradition, although maybe more so in indigenous um, courts. But I think what it's doing is something that the public trust doctrine also did that was really important, I'm writing about this in the book right now, which is that it has this power to shift the conversation, even if it fails in court. One of the functions that the court serves for the public is it's a place where you can go and air your grievances. And even if you lose in court, like Juliana will probably do at this point, they manage to get their message out to impact, leverage the other branches of government to, to think about these issues, like happened in Massachusetts in, in the government that I mentioned. So we have to remember that it's kind of a conversation between all three branches of government. And so things that don't succeed judicially don't mean that they're ineffective. It may just be that they're having their effect by leveraging the power available to litigants, citizens as litigants, to communicate with these other branches of government. So, I mean, in part, I mean, if obsolescence means no utility whatsoever, well, then no. Uh, but I don't, I'm feeling, I view obsolescence more as a question of being outdated in a way that severely hampers the contemporary effectiveness. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the giant tube-based TV that I had when I got married, that, like, had the, that, that was like the, like the most awesome TV I ever imagined having when I got it in like, I don't know, like the 90s or something. Um, you know, when I, when I got married and we were, my wife and I figuring out what we're doing, you know, you know, we realized that was kind of an obsolete TV. Uh, it wasn't cable ready or whatever. Yeah, I mean, but it, I could still watch TV on it. It was better than nothing. Up until the point you know, we were um, uh, moving together and figuring out what was going where, I didn't want to get rid of it. But it was obsolete, right? Um, the computer I have that won't run Windows, I don't know, 8 or whatever, I can do stuff on it, but it's, it's obsolete. I mean, I think that's a fair use of the word. Um, and, and the point I'm, I'm, I mean, the reason for using it is because I, I do think we're in a moment where this I, this idea that that laws, particularly in the regulatory context, are not being kept contemporary or up to date, um, and that that is something that across a wide range of areas creates a certain set of problems that come to court, makes it worth thinking about um, in this context because I think it's something that in in technology in te technology dependent spaces it's particularly important. And I think telecom and environment are, are there. So I mean, you know, but if there's a better word, uh, you know, outdated doesn't have the same <laughs> rhetorical. So I'm, I'm just going to follow up here to partially disagree, I think, with one of the premises of this conversation. Um, I, I think we, as law professors, tend to evaluate statutory and, and, and legal regime change by asking if the statute is being updated and if major rulemakings are happening. And this is a permitting statute. And what I have learned through the research projects I've done on the Clean Water Act is that it is evolving constantly in implementation through permitting. And these are five-year permits in many cases. So there are constant cycles. The next permit is different from the last one in some ways. Uh, and so I think in, in some areas it is probably not evolving as much as it should, in others maybe more so. There is a need, I think, for legislative updates and rulemaking and things like that. But I think it's a mistake to think that things are static out there um, when changes on the ground through permitting have been significant and, and really, in many cases, incremental and steady over long periods of time. Go ahead. So I have a normative claim I want you guys to maybe get at and then, uh, well, a descriptive one and then see if it extends to a normative claim, which is when the Clean Water Act was passed, right, it, I think either at the time or over time became one of those super statutes right, that we've had described uh, by the court, either having some kind of super statutory effect or some sort of quasi-constitutional effect, which extended into the broader administ administrative state, right? When we talk about 
the administrative state, I think most people are really thinking about environmental regulation writ large in that context. If that's sort of the case, then these developments like the public trust doctrine and maybe even the rights of nature seem to be less to be supplements than to be sort of substrata, right? Sort of the reasons for the existence of such regulation and justif justifications for that regulation rather than necessarily interpretation of that regulation. And I'm curious, which direction do you think that pulls, right? Does that pull us to therefore seeking to do more of this kind of statutory centralization, maybe even cooperative at that sort of super statutory level? Or should that push us to do more de sort of de devolution, right? In the sense that let's get it all the way down to these smaller regional units, um, which are more capable of doing this kind of, you know, sub, you know, sub level work at implementing that particular set of rights and, and, and ideas. Yeah, so the, so the first part of your question was, is uh, public trust rights of nature, are they like the reasons for the Clean Water Act? And therefore, does that say something, does that change something about the relationship between the doctrines in which becomes more important? Is that no, I think, I think the descriptive claim is that these are not just normal statutes, right? They have a power both as a function of organizing society, organizing business, organizing behavior that goes beyond what we think of normal statutes doing, almost to the level of sort of a kind of constitutional framework, right, around that. And the question is, if that's something that we think is ha has happened with that and the broader administrative state, the questions are, where, which direction should we go then, right? Do we go further? to further constitutionalize that work, or do we sort of adopt the movement that's happening right now, which is to devolve and get away from constitutionalization and super statutory work on environmental. And Nishan, I'm gonna to leave to uh, my colleagues whether, whether we should see the Clean Water Act as a constitutional kind of a feature. Um, I, I'll just, because you started with public trust and rights of nature, I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying, I think you're right to notice that you know the premises of the public trust doctrine, are, to the extent that the premise of the public trust doctrine is that waterways belong to everyone, everyone has an interest in them, and to the extent that the rights of nature movement says waterways deserve to be protected because they are worthy of protection, even independently of their utilitarian functions. Therefore, we should have a Clean Water Act that makes us clean them up as part of the way we protect them. I mean, I think that's a legitimate way of ordering the concerns. Um, as a legal mechanism, the public trust doctrine and the rights of nature m movement are so weak by comparison to the remedies that are available within the Clean Water Act that th they are functioning as a, s they may be the reason for the Clean Water Act, but they don't exist, um, in most cases, they don't exist with the, the legal remedial force that the Clean Water Act has. That they, that's why I've characterized them as kind of last resort doctrines, where you go in as a gap filler because you're trying to do something that the statutory laws don't, don't quite get to, but it's so much easier to just get a result, and the law tells you what that result should be in many cases with these super statutory approaches like the Clean Water Act. So I don't know whether, I, I would not vote for getting rid of any of them, but I would vote for the Clean Water Act. It's not up to me. But if it were, I would think that the Clean Water Act in its less obsolete version could maybe do more to correct the central flaw of American water law that we've recognized for a long time, which is this artificial separation of regulating water quality and regulating water quantity, when you can't really do it. So, you know, the, the Clean Water Act next version, sorry, should do better to correct some of the failures that, that set us up to meeting rights of nature and public I wouldn't get rid of any of them for the same reason that I think that these doctrines do work in my conversation with Jim Salzman. That these doctrines are doing work by being like backstops to one another. That you know, we, we never get it all the way right. So we have a number of different approaches to try to kind of enter the, the fray and try to correct these problems. I'm going to talk sideways from your question. Um, uh, to make a couple, a couple of short claims that are, that are somewhat responsive. One, I know as academics we like thinking about certain statutes and super statutes and, and kind of the quasi constitutional aspects of, of, of the administrative state. Um, if that was ever true as just a matter of kind of where the courts are now, no, 
Um, and and the Clean Water Act context in particular, right? The, we keep talking about the order from from Wednesday. I mean, you know, the, whatever one thinks about how states were or were not taking advantage of Section Four Hundred One, I mean, the the Clean Water Act, the Section Four Hundred One of the Clean Water Act, had been applied pretty consistently pursuant to a Supreme Court opinion for what thirty years. Um, and the Biden administration wants to go back to that position and, and the Supreme Court's kind of saying no, or it could say no to the court staying the Trump rule that the Biden administration wants to, I mean, so that's, that's kind of, at best, that's just, you know, it's basic administrative law, you know, we have a, a rule that has not been withdrawn until it is withdrawn, you, it's, it's not just gonna get blown up by a court that hasn't, I mean, that's kind of the way the Supreme Court's looking at it. It's one descriptive claim. The other one I'd say is, you know, there are two stories we can tell, or there's a story we can tell about environmental law. I'm not sure it's true, but it's a story that I think is appealing, right? Which is one of the reasons we have a lot of environmental law is because there was a system, a systemic failure of legal, existing legal and political institutions to protect rights when those rights were violated in what we would care through what we would characterize as environmental harms. And um, you know, I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure that's entirely true as a historical matter. Maybe something of a fable, um, but I do think that, that 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 story has normative force, right? That 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 you know, even folks that tend to you know, when people are critical of environmental law, they talk about the bureaucratic aspects of it. They talk about the red tape. They talk about the SAGAs not being able to build a home. They don't talk about com a company dumping stuff into someone else's backyard or poisoning their children. And I think that's why, right? Because there is this kind of conception of what environmental law at least might be about, which isn't rooted so much in rights of nature and public trust and so on, but is actually rooted in a very kind of you know, traditional liberal notion of rights and, and, and that the state exists to protect against harms. And if the trespasses are occurring through pollution, they are just as deserving as, as control of as if it's you know if it's the the mobile home that's driven across your uh, your field your snow covered field for those of you that have uh, read uh, used the, read the Merrill Smith case book. I mean, again, I, I'm not sure that's I, I like that account. I'm not sure it's actually what happened, but um, you know those sorts of accounts do help us understand kind of what purpose the law should be per performing in the, in this space and 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 maybe give us a metric for deciding whether or not we, we like what it's doing. That's kind of an answer. Sure, coming up on time, but we've got a couple more. Go ahead. Well, um, okay, thanks. I, um, a quick question for um, uh, Dave Owen and then a, maybe a longer one for Jonathan. I don't know how much time we have. It'll, it'll come out of my closing remarks, so it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll leave that up to you then. Um, all right, so, so Dave, the question really just is about the successes that you talk about, about treating non-point sources in Northern California. How much of that is attributable to basically easy requirements in your, in your experience? I'm just wondering if there's been a high level of acceptance because they're really not being asked to do very much at this point. Um, so that's just one question. Um, uh, and, and for Jonathan, um, you know, I can't disagree that there's some obsolescence in the law. For you know, a hundred years, we had a law in the books in Michigan that banned swearing in public places. <laughs> Definitely obsolete and finally repealed. And I'm the only one in my room in in my lecture class this semester who still has a landline. So you know, federal law governing landlines are going to get less and less relevant. But um, con I mean, Congress isn't sunsetting this legislation, and it seems to me that the big problem here is that. Um, or not really the problem, but you know, Congress is overwhelmed. There are tremendous obstacles to actually getting legislation enacted. So Congress is making a strategic choice, which is to legislate broadly. We have other means of legal change, and there's a lot of acquiescence built into the system. So the vast majority of executive efforts get go unchecked in court. Uh, you know, Professor Dave Owen mentioned that you know the law is evolving constantly through permitting. Things aren't static. Nobody's raising a point of order. Nobody's passing a Congressional Review Act resolution. So shouldn't we instead see this as sort of an uneasy modern compromise where Congress is, you know, legislating broadly and muddling through? 
with a fair amount of acquiescence. And wouldn't it be a problem to basically force Congress to effectively sunset a whole lot of these laws? Um, and just to make it a little more provocative, maybe the problem is really the court um, and the solution to the court getting frustrated with what it sees as this uneasy modern compromise. The solution is, you know, 15 year terms for Supreme Court justices. Okay, I'll leave it there. So my answer to your second question is yes. Um, my answer to the first the question you actually asked me um, is, um, it's complicated, but there are some there are some pretty demanding requirements. And just to give you one example, again, I'll come back to the Consolino versus Nasri case, just because I think it may be familiar to some of you. If you read the fine print of that case, um, the Consolinos claimed expenses of about a million dollars from the regulations that were imposed on them. Um, Larry, I think Myliard is how the guy's name is pronounced, um, who's another landowner, claimed expenses of about $11 million. And I did have a student who once said, yeah, well, he owns all of Sonoma County, so no big deal to him. But still, there were, if you are telling logging companies or individual landowners you need to preserve buffer zones along streams, which in a redwood forest is where the trees grow the fastest, and you're also saying you need to stay off or limit your harvests on steep slopes. It's all steep slopes in a lot of these areas. Those are demanding requirements. Similarly, I think the requirements that were imposed on dairies, less demanding, you know, putting fences, but the margins of these businesses are tiny. Um, and regulators told me, like, you know, we're, we're conscious that we are coming out here with regulations for a bunch of 70-year-old dudes who are barely making it as it is. Um, so there were legitimate regulatory requirements in some places. In other places, they're easing in and taking it fairly soft. And I think it definitely matters also that they could go out and say, you know, we're regulating you and you need to fix your roads so then our roading, oh no, by the way, it's gonna save you money also to have a road that isn't eroding or to go into landowners and say, we can get some grant funding because this protects salmon or in some cases to say there's a nonprofit that would actually just like to buy your land and then you don't have to deal with being regulated. So there's a whole package of reasons why they are able to make inroads, but the, they are doing things that, that impose real changes in some circumstances. So I took the court as a given. We could have a conversation what the court should or should not be doing. I'm sure we won't agree. Um, um, but you know, from the standpoint of thinking about the Clean Water Act, my you know my view is is that the court, you know, if you're if you're working at the EPA, if you're in Congress and you care about water pollution control, what the courts will will not accept is a constraint you care about, um, and so I think it's a relevant constraint to think about. Um, I do think Congress having the rules it has about authorization, and up until 1994, reauthorizing environmental statutes pretty regularly. Um, is an indication that they kind of did sunset those portions of the laws, right? They didn't sunset the prohibitions, so it's different than what you see in a lot of state sunset laws, um, where, where actually the whole program, including prohibitions, have to be have to be renewed in in some cases. Where uh, under you know, some states have have sunset laws like that, but that was kind of the premise upon which Congress enacted the statutes, right? And and what happened in 1994 was that the congressional leadership decided that it didn't like what the laws were gonna look like if they were reauthorized, so they decided not to reauthorize them. And then um, Congress never came back to the table. Uh, well, they did for the Safe Drinking Water Act, but I think for not for pretty much the rest. Um, and I do think that creates an opportunity um, if one thinks that there are things you could do in the Clean Water Act that would make it more effective if you could get everyone to the table. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that premise, but if I'm right that there are things, that if you could get everyone to the table and, and, and get them to take a vote on it, that there are things that would make the law better able to address the sorts of problems we deal with today, then I think, then I think thinking about what gets you to that point is useful. Um, thank my co-panelists. Thank all of you for, for, for being here all day. Um, thanks to our speakers and our moderators. Um, the papers from this will be published in, in a volume of uh, the Case Western Reserve Law Review, so thanks to the Law Review students that helped us out and whose work on this is just beginning. Um, uh, 
Uh, you know, we can't do this without a, a lot of other help, as I mentioned this morning. Um, um, Rob, who's hiding back there, um, helping us with the AV and, and, getting, she and getting Sheila Olmsted to be with us on the fly. Um, uh, Patty and Eric, who are outside, who, who do so much for the center and for, for all the centers to be able to do programs like this. Um, you know, I, my dean, neither of my deans could be here today, but um, uh, you know, I, I certainly appreciate the support they give to programs like this. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, I always think it's important to remember Coley Burke, um, who made this possible. So thank you all. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, uh, thanks for being part of what I certainly found to be an enjoyable conversation and uh, an illuminating one and a provocative one. And I look forward to our being able to have more such conversations in the future. So have a good weekend, safe travels home to wherever that will be, and I look forward to seeing all of you again soon.